it's my pleasure to extend a cheerful welcome to for the lecture scholarly writing in english studies organized by classic journal club department of english now i i like to invite our respectable h kachori chandra sena rajeshwaran ma to deliver your welcome address saranya uh, it's bonnie sri ma'am who is giving the welcome address sure. Thank you, Saranya, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, one and all present here. Um, I feel immense pleasure to welcome to give welcome address for this uh, wonderful gathering. Uh, first of all, I thank our honourable. president acs arun kumar sir for for his support and uh, permission to conduct such programs i whole heartedly welcome deans hods chief guest and when sorry chief guest dr anwar sadar associate professor of english director iqxc the new college chennai i welcome you all for this program thank you thank you shreema now i call ms akshaya to introduce our first person dr anwar sadat so thank you saranya ma'am Good afternoon, everyone. It's immense pleasure to introduce our energetic speaker of the day, Dr. Anwar. Dr. Anwar has been teaching English in government-aided position at New College Autonomous Chennai since January 2000. 2000. He holds MA, MPhil, PhD in English from University of Calicut. His areas of academic interest include new literature in English, cultural studies, literary theory, and post-colonialism. post colonial studies and academic writing dr anwar has successfully guided one phd and 39 mphil and five phd candidates he is currently supervising six phd candidates and two mphil projects he has to his credit over 25 academic publishing and has presented papers in several seminars and conferences besides he has published three books His books on academic writing is currently prescribed for UGC studies, UGC students in University of Calicut under the general English. He delivered about sixty special lect lectures, including keynotes and special and validity address in seminars and various institution in India. He has served as a resource person in fifteen academic workshop. Currently, Dr. Anwar is holding additional in charge of director of IQAC in this institute. Sir, we are honored by your presence on this occasion, sir. We hope having a person like you will enlighten the student, teacher, community on the old. And we offer for university and department. We pray Almighty to bless you with more and more laurels. Thank you. Saranya, ma'am. Saranya, ma'am. Is okay, sir. Ma'am, can you hear me? Without further delay, I welcome Dr. Anwar. to proceed to session so please thank you thank you very much sir your voice is very low okay i'll i'll uh, speak a little louder okay yes. okay thank yes. you sir yes. right i'll sit closer to the mic a very good afternoon to one and all present at this meeting 
uh, honorable head of the department chandrasena honorable coordinator of this event ms akshaya uh, ms aranya the other faculty members from the department of english and institute uh, other uh, you know invitees and uh, delegates I am happy to see some of my colleagues also, Dr. Nasrul Bhavakthiari and uh, Dr. Nasir. I am very delighted to be part of uh, this event today. Uh, I confess in the beginning that it is uh, very challenging to impart considerable kind of information or uh, considerable kind of uh, wisdom on a scholarly writing in English studies uh, in a, in an hour's talk. The topic is, uh, you know, as all of you are aware, the topic is uh, very wide. And keeping that in mind, I'll try to uh, touch upon some of the major aspects of academic writing and other aspects. I'm very grateful to uh, uh, MGR University for inviting me for this event. And I'm grateful to Ms. Akshaya for the general introduction about me, generous introduction about me. Uh, when we talk about uh, scholarly writing, you know, first thing I need to do is uh, I must clarify the two terms that we use here. One is uh, scholarly writing and the other is English studies. I'll, I'll just uh, use a slide here, okay, so, so that you know we can have something on the screen. It will be better, I think. Can you see the screen now? Yes, sir. Okay. If the screen is going off, you just uh, alert me, okay? Because I'll not be able to see the other screen. Okay, right. Sure. Okay, right. So, uh, first thing is, uh, there are two terms I'm using, you know, uh, there are two terms in the title. One is scholarly writing and the other is English studies. Let me just clarify that before we proceed into the other details. Uh, the term scholarly writing, as all of you are aware, uh, you know, is also uh, known as academic writing. And academic writing is uh, an activity which is inevitable in all academic institutions, whether it is a college or a university. And the three terms that define academic writing are formal, objective, and technical. When we think of academic writing, Primarily, we understand that academic writing is formal, academic writing is objective, and academic writing is technical. These are the three things that we... I'm not going into the details at this point. Probably I'll come back to this point a little later. And uh, scholarly writing include research or seminar papers, dissertations, uh, assignments, writing assignments given to students at the college or university level term papers and things like that. All these things come under academic writing. Academic writing uh, is a means of communication among scholars or academicians who are working in a university, in universities and colleges. There is a kind of, this is a, this is a communication channel. They communicate academic matters through this uh, medium. And the most important thing about scholarly writing is that to survive in an academic academy, you know, I mean, college or universities in today's scenario, academic writing or scholarly writing has become quite essential. We will not be able to survive in the academy without writing. And specifically, all of you know that uh, suppose someone is pursuing PhD. The university insists that you know they have to publish two papers in uh, you know specific type of journals, and they have to present papers in seminars, and uh, you know uh, there are other factors like you know when an institution is going for accreditation, assessment, and all that, 
uh, the citation index of uh, the, the papers published by the institution are taken into account. The impact factor is taken into account. So uh, writing is essential to survive in the academy. You know, in American universities, there is a common saying, common uh, notion uh, of uh, publish or perish. You know, is a common notion in, in for academicians. That is, if a, if an academician is not publishing anything in a semester, he will not be there in the next semester. And that's the kind of seriousness that writing, you know, has acquired in in American and you know in other many foreign universities. And uh, for uh, performance indicator, you know, as a writing is often taken as a performance indicator. You know, when you calculate the academic performance. Uh, of a faculty member, writing plays a very, very important role. And today, uh, the journal in which people publish or the kind of books in which people publish also matter a lot because uh, each journal has its own, uh, shall we say, standard. And, you know, there are websites and, you know, um, we can say that journal consortia that great journals according to uh, their ranking and another another very pre preliminary thing that we need to know about academic writing is that when we engage in academic writing we presume that we are addressing a learned audience we are not talking to uh, people who do not know anything about the subject that you know uh, we are dealing with uh, we do not typically, for example, uh, define the very fundamental kind of things. For example, when you are writing about, uh, uh, you know, a literary work, you may be using certain technical terms, like literary, uh, shall we say, literary terms. But you don't, you don't uh, normally define those literary terms. You presume that the your reader is already aware of all this. So. Uh, academic writing or scholarly writing is aimed at an academic audience or a learned audience of peers, okay, people who are on par with uh, the writer or people who are probably above the writer in terms of their academic training. And uh, one more thing that we need to, a very preliminary, uh, very preliminary thing that we need to understand about scholarly writing is that uh, there is a code of ethics in scholarly writing. Everyone is expected to follow a, a code of ethics. You know, this code of code of ethics include, uh, you know, acknowledging the sources of the information that you get. Whenever you use, uh, uh, you know, others in others' words and others' ideas, you have to acknowledge it. And it's uh, uh, often considered under a broad uh, area called academic integrity. Now, in, in very simple terms, when you write a scholarly paper, you are expected to very clearly differentiate between what you say and what others say. This exactly is what uh, is uh, meant by acknowledging the sources. Okay? What you say and what others say is uh, need to be very clearly defined. And coming to English studies, you know, English studies is, you know, it, it can be uh, addressed as a very broad term that refers to all activities that are conducted in the English department. Right. You know, in, in today's English departments in India, uh, we have, uh, uh, we are engaging in teaching of English uh, language and literature. We teach uh, English language teaching that or ELT. And uh, we teach English language, linguistics, phonetics, stylistics, pragmatics, and many other, you know, technical kind of uh, components. And English department also sometimes is turning out in, in recent times as uh, centers of cultural studies or cultural theory, study of cultural theory, uh, study of translation studies. So these are some of the activities. You know, all these things come under the broad spectrum called English studies, anything that we do. Literature studies, you know, it's a very broad that there are so many subdivisions within literary studies. And one important thing in English studies is that like any other discipline, anyone who is pursuing English studies, anyone who is working in an English department is expected to specialize in some area. 
Now, although our uh, UG and PG syllabi may not allow us to be very specific because we may have to teach British literature for one class, American literature for another class, Indian writing in another class, and foundation course in English for another few classes. So there are some constraints for English teachers in India in uh, you know specializing them. But still, every individual teacher working in a in an academy or in an English department is expected to specialize in some area. When you know someone is asking you what is your area of specialization, you need to be able to tell something. This area of specialization, uh, you know, can be, you know, if it is literature, it can be a geographical indicator like Indian literature, American literature, British literature, or post-colonial literature, or something like that. Or it can even be, you know, very broad, uh, you know, shall we say, borderless categories like comparative literature, world literature, transnational literature, uh, diasporic uh, literature, things like that. It can either be a geographical indicator or it can be, you know, there are, there are no very clearly defined boundaries. It can also be literary theory, for example. Even within literary theory, sometimes, you know, people may focus on certain theories. Like, for example, I'm specializing in cultural studies. Some people would say that I'm specializing in, in uh, structuralism. And specializing in post-structuralism, things like that. So uh, there is a need for specializing. You know, in in when we think of uh, and the, when we think of scholarly writing in our subject, this is one of the first things that we have to come into, uh, you know, uh, come to terms with. That is, in English department, we are dealing with so many things. What are you specializing in? Is it uh, you know Indian literature? Is it ELT? Is it linguistics? Is it phonetics? Is it spoken English or is it uh, Communication skills, anything can be there. So all these things, uh, you know, come under the broad umbrella called English studies. Okay. And one more very fundamental thing that we need to keep in mind is that English studies is part of a broad disciplinary area called humanities. Okay, another word for humanities is liberal arts, and you know, we call it liberal arts in most of the universities. These departments are called liberal arts department. For example, department of history, department of English, you know, department of you know, other language departments, philosophy, religion, uh, departments dealing with art, music, language. All these departments are normally referred to as liberal arts departments, and all these subjects are considered as liberal arts. We know that you know all of you are aware that humanities is uh, one of the you know a few disciplinary areas that we have in higher education institution. When we go for higher education institutions, now there are probably some very broad kind of uh, disciplinary areas like, uh, you know, science, for example. Within science, we have physical science, bi biological, physical and chemical science, biological science, applied science, and things like that. But science is one, one category. And, uh, you know, within science also, we have computational science, which include computer science and mathematics and all that. And, uh, you know, another important category is social science. And the third category is humanities. When we think of scholarly writing in, you know, uh, uh, in, in a discipline, we have to first keep in mind that we are bound by certain methodological restrictions of the discipline. This discipline has got certain methodological, uh, you know, for example, uh, the kind of methodology used to pursue research in science, you know, and social sciences are distinct, different from each other. And uh, both these methodologies may not be applied in studying humanities. Therefore, methodological distinctiveness need to be taken into account. As a broad disciplinary area, we can very commonly say certain things about humanities. Humanities, uh, you know, deal with uh, people, you know, how how people express ideas, how people process information, how people express feelings or uh, how, uh, you know, the experiences of being human, what is the meaning of being human and things like that. And humanities, uh, you know, one uh, very simplest thing that we can talk about the subjects that come under humanities is that humanities recognize the individual distinctiveness of uh, you know uh, each human being in, in other words 
no two human beings think alike no two human beings operate their creativity or their intellectual caliber in a in a similar manner each one is distinct each one is unique so when we lit, when we study literature uh, you know each writer may belong to uh, you know certain categories like post colonialism or indian writing but even then uh, as individual writers they are distinct so you know there there's a particular concept called uh, singularity singularity can be applied in understanding this so in humanities when we do studies in humanities what we normally do is we make recent arguments you know we don't do any kind of lab experiment we don't collect data from the society normally we don't collect you know using a uh, questionnaire or you know shall we say uh, interview schedule we don't collect data from the public or any audience we depend on books and cultural artifacts and other things you know in fact a person pursuing research in humanities need not necessarily uh, go for a field work of course you know there are certain areas like uh, anthropology in which you know people do uh you know uh certain you certain methods like uh, you know uh, ethno ethnographic ethnography as a method of research such cases you know they have to live with the community you know with which uh, they are dealing with uh, i mean the community of their uh, you know research subject and sometimes you know, accepting that normally we deal with books and you know we can sit back in our libraries or in our homes or uh, with our e resources we can create recent arguments and these arguments recent arguments can be developed into full length scholarly papers so each discipline i what i wanted to uh, emphasize here is that i'm not going into details because this is a very broad area what i want to just to say that each discipline has a methodology discipline means broad disciplinary areas like science social science and humanities so uh this need to be kept in mind by everyone who is pursuing uh, right and because you know the most important subject in english studies is literature uh we must also understand certain rudimentary things about uh, writing on literature okay. normally uh what is to be written is uh, in in literature you know when we say that i am i'm writing a paper for a seminar i'm writing a paper for publication i'm writing a research paper you know when, when someone is making this kind of a statement what they mean to say is that they are writing essays you know uh, actually the broad name that we can use uh, one single name that we can use to refer to the genre of our writing activity is essay it is what we write is essay and of course you know there are some finer details that we have to understand uh, and when we say it is an essay we have to primarily keep in mind that we have to write essays in the form of paragraphs and not in the form of bullet points and numbers and all that okay. of course there may be certain occasions when you have to use some kind of illustration suppose uh, not not uh, particularly in literature very rarely but uh, in uh, in other disciplines like elt and linguistics and all that you may have to use a lot of charts and you know things like that but in literature by and large you know we use essays and and our paragraphs are consisting mainly of uh, you know shall we say text text matter okay there no very very rarely we have illustrations pictures and all that right so we write essays and when we say essays it is written in the form of paragraphs and usually whenever writing assignments are uh, given to students you know there are uh, in, in western universities particularly they give a warning signal again okay? what is the warning do not simply restate the facts paraphrase or summarize okay. this is one common instruction given to all those who are given writing assignments particularly in western universities when you want to write in literature if you write uh, if you simply summarize the book if you simply paraphrase the book uh if you restate the facts in that book you know maybe names of characters and what they do and who they are that will not become a scholarly paper a paper on literature rarely passes muster if it is a mere paragraph paraphrase or summary of uh, of this summary what is needed is we need arguments 
or claims about literary texts. We need claims or arguments. We have to make certain claims about literary texts, you know, beyond. But, you know, of course, we, I, I'm not meaning to say that we don't need paraphrase and summaries and restating of facts at all. We need them, but we need them only when we try to substantiate or support the claims that we make. In order to substantiate our claims, in order to, uh, you know, shall we say, clarify certain points that we are raising, we need to make required. But otherwise, you know, the main focus is not on summarizing or paraphrasing, but on making claims or arguments, central arguments. That is, uh, if you if you feel like asking anything, you can put the question in the chat box, you know, uh, so that you'll not forget. And you can also, uh, you know, ask me because you know I'm I'm uh, you know dealing with a very vast area of uh, you know shall we say area of English studies. I will not be able to cover everything, so that you can you can reserve your questions. You can either type it on the chat box or you can ask me that. What is a literature paper? That is, uh, what do we do when we write a literature paper? Actually, a literature paper, you know, so I'm making some fundamental remarks and I'll be moving on to certain uh, technical aspects of uh, uh, scholarly writing. Literature papers are written in expository prose, usually, okay. And it's not a very clear demarcation. Expository prose in the sense that, you know, the kind of prose that we use that uh, aims at uh, explaining something complex, you know, here in, the, in, this, in this context, a literary work. So we give a uh, we try to give a kind of explanation for a literary work, okay? and we use three different types of paragraphs. So I'll, I'll come back to this when we discuss the paragraph uh, things, these types of paragraphs. And as we have mentioned in the previous uh, this, uh, slide, uh, literature paper requires every literature paper requires a central idea or a claim. And uh, literature papers aim at providing a new and deeper understanding of uh, that text. New and deeper understanding. This must be something new. We are not, uh, you know, saying something which is already being said by others. Either we have to say something new. Probably, you know, uh, when you say, uh, when you make a, a kind of statement, probably you make a statement about the poems of uh, Emily Dickinson, uh, that the way in which she incorporates the religious values of Christianity or something like that. If you think that this has not been told by anybody earlier, that is me. If so many people have already discussed it, that's not me. And another thing is that we have to uh, make deeper understanding, deeper understanding will be pro pro possible only when we make close critical readings. Okay? That is what we need, close critical reading. And another very key word in literature paper is that we normally use is analysis. The word analysis is very crucial. You know, analysis actually, uh, you know, basic meaning of analysis is that, you know, dictionary type of meaning of analysis is that. Breaking the work into its constituent parts and showing how they work together to form a meaningful form. That is, uh, a writer, when, when we uh, very closely read a book, for example, we will come across so many constituent elements forming into an organic whole. For example, you know, if you have read uh, Kushwan Singh's novel, very old novel, uh, uh, what's that? Uh, 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 Kushan Singh's famous novel. Uh, Train to Pakistan, sir. Train to, Train to Pakistan, Pakistan, sir. Train to Pakistan, sorry. Train to Pakistan. If you very closely look at this novel, this Train to Pakistan, which is a partition novel, you can see that uh, at, at, uh, at different levels, the author is trying to prioritize Sikhism and Sikh community. Okay, right? And uh, you know, it is it is a kind of novel which is uh, putting six over, which is placing six over, you know, Hindus and Muslims there in Manu Majra. Yes. Manu Majra is the place where the border town in which it is. Right? So, uh, 
and you know this is not in one sentence or one paragraph the writer is telling us you know that uh, writer is you know showing that it is sick uh, oriented uh, rather you know the, the entire novel is spread out with elements if you put those elements together you will understand that yes this author is trying to make a you know a claim that sikhism is uh, you know a superior uh, kind of a culture here and they have they are exercising authority both over muslims as well as over hindus in in that manomatra right but there are there you know, if you go still deeper into it there may be further politics you know about uh, the communities will and communities shall we say priorities in the, the larger context of shall we say india's uh, partition into india and pakistan so that that's just an example you know i can give you many examples like that owing to time constraints and moving on another word very commonly used is argument argument is uh, you know an effort to convince uh, someone that the analysis is valid you know we argue you know there is a, there is an element of argument in all scholarly papers this element of argument is used to convince that you know what we are trying to say is valid now throughout a paper that we write we are you know trying to convince our readers that what we try to say is right that we have to convince you know for which we may have to use a lot of evidence and things like that okay. and uh, another thing is another uh, very crucial word when we write about literature is it should be objective we are not writing objective is opposite of subjective we are not giving a personal you know our reading or our presentation of a scholarly paper should not look like uh, a personal observation you know, sometimes you know after reading a book you feel like saying something okay you know these these uh, things can be referred to as personal reflections okay now you feel like you know, sometimes the book may be connecting you in some way or the other sometimes you know, the book may be affecting you emotionally intellectually and in different ways okay here instead of giving an individual's perspective instead of giving you know although the perspective that you are bringing in the paper is your own and your own personal thing we don't show like that okay? we create the aura of objectivity you know as if you know this uh, reading is not my own reading rather many other people will will try to subscribe to this kind of a world that kind of a feeling may be there that is why objectivity is required so instead of saying you know i have understood i feel i think you know that all those things we don't normally use because we want to catch the attention of a larger audience i think right so if you use you know personal pronouns uh, for example the paper will be uh, considered as something which is coming out of an individual's you know limited reading so we make it broad deliberate i'm not meaning to say that you know this personal pronouns are completely uh, you know denied but of course there are occasions for that we will clarify that uh, later if, if that occasion comes and very very important uh, last point in this uh, thing is uh, evidence okay when we think of a paper in literature we make you know we have already told that uh, we have already discussed that there is a central idea or a claim the central idea or a claim need to be substantiated or explained you know by showing uh, you know evidence okay? evidence may be for example uh, a textual quotation may be an evidence okay? textual quotation may be an evidence okay? or a secondary quotation may be an evidence secondary quotation people have made a hint about the existence of this thing in 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 some other paper okay that may be an evidence it can also be a tertiary idea in which you know a theoretical explanation is given to this phenomenon okay? the phenomenon which you are you know dealing with in your in your paper so uh what are the prerequisites for writing a literature paper right uh not only literature paper any kind of scholarly paper this is uh, you know common for any kind of scholarly paper what are the prerequisites what do you require and all of us are and most of the participants here are either uh, faculty members or research scholars and all of us have to have the need to write you know Uh, papers and research papers and seminar papers and all that so uh, how, how do we prepare for this it is a very you know i know that in almost all of these things may be familiar to you still you know if i leave out this, this, there may be some kind of a background so first thing is that 
we need to have the habit of communicating through the medium of writing only a person who has the habit of writing will be able to train himself as a scholarly writer okay? habit of communicating through writing writing you know as we all agree a uh, writing is probably the most uh, challenging skill for our students when we teach in, in my experience of teaching i understand that uh, teaching writing is the most challenging thing you know, as compared to teaching uh, speaking or teaching listening or speaking or teaching reading teaching is writing is the most challenging and another thing is that in our education system uh, writing is probably the most neglected skill among the four basic skills so habit of communicating through the writing is the first step that everyone who wants to be an expert in scholarly writing should we we need to write something every day that's simply speaking there should not be a single day without writing something now it may be uh, a personal journal writing or it may be reflections it may be reflections on teaching it may be reflections on what we read it may be a critical assessment anything like that without uh, showing anyone you can keep those writing skills. second thing is that formal writing skills in english formal writing uh, means uh, in a formal writing context the main difference is that uh, we make a difference in our english language use as compared to our english language use or speaking purposes okay? when we uh, speak for example we use a lot of expressions you know which may not be may not sound good in in a formal formal writing formal means uh, you know the basic uh, formality comes in not only in the structure of our sentences but also in the words that we choose right words that we choose for example we use less frequently used words you know this point i think i am coming uh, to again so formal means uh, uh, you keep in mind that an elevated audience it is not to your friends or anybody who is very close to you you are uh, talking to scholars okay that, that's what we have to so uh, when you prepare to talk to scholars you need to develop an english writing skills which is very very formal okay it may look very awkward sometimes you, know, you may think that you know how will common people understand me if i write like this you may think but you have to keep in mind that this is you are not writing for common people your audience is somebody different your audience is someone different your audience is scholar scholars and you know academicians therefore you need not worry about that and the third thing is that you know while preparing to write scholarly papers we need to master the language of academic writing the language of academic writing include there is a there is a list of words called academic word list it's called awl you know any all almost all standard dictionaries will contain a list of words called awl the academic word list and this academic word list can also be searched actually it was uh, you know uh, discovered or you know introduced by a very famous scholar from new zealand okay. and uh, what she did is you know she has uh, collected the words which are which are you know high frequency words in academic papers you know she has made a research into so many papers so many papers published uh, in 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 field of uh, uh, you know academic papers and she has identified certain words for, for probably about uh, 500 plus words which are found to be very frequently repeated in academic papers okay right words uh, you know that are frequently used in academic writing okay, that is what we call awl and uh, of course that means that we have to use less frequently used words and there are also in academic uh, language you know we have to maintain uh, that we have to avoid wordiness we have to maintain parallelism we have to diversify our sentences and we have to be very very clear about the punctuation okay right and uh, punctuation marks in you know, certain punctuation marks like quotes and uh, you know, quotation marks they are they are, they are very very important in formal writing uh you know the moment you say formal writing you will be looked for accuracy you will be looked for accuracy for example uh almost all academic publications aim at 99.9% accuracy in, in their language use they do not want any kind of uh, shall we say mistakes to be there whether it is a comma or a colon or a semicolon or anything like that so accuracy is Now, as I have just mentioned, you know the tone and uh, tone of what you write. Okay, 
you need to understand the tone of uh, what you try to write in order to become an academic writer you must be aware of the tone of such papers okay the tone is decided by awareness of the audience who is your audience and probably when a, when a student is writing a paper his uh, the, the the person who may be reading it probably is his own instructor his own professor okay, right but still he has to keep in mind that this paper is going to be read by peers okay people of his uh, you know knowledge is of higher level of learning so we have to keep in mind that uh, the audience audience is an academic audience and a learned audience you know, uh, an audience of intellectuals therefore uh, we need not uh, you know resort to explaining very rudimentary things as i told in the beginning okay and very very important uh, uh, you know prerequisite for becoming scholarly writers is an understanding of uh, the fundamentals of academic essay and uh, uh, the rules of writing an essay okay. I mean, as, as we know that academic essay is constituted by different types of paragraphs for example uh, you know we have uh, introductory paragraph we have body paragraphs and we have concluding paragraph okay right so different paragraphs there that how is an essay constituted what are the basic rules of an essay uh that is that i i'll come back to this point i think come back to academic paragraph you know once more you know then i'll explain a little further when you think of essay we have to keep in mind that an essay is a combination of paragraphs okay we when, when we teach essay to students at ug level classes we normally tell them that an essay should have at least five paragraphs okay that is an introductory paragraph a concluding paragraph and at least three paragraphs in between called the body paragraphs okay. that we say in in ug classes and all that likewise uh, you know when we think of uh, scholarly writing we need to keep in mind that we are writing essays and our essays are constituted by paragraphs and each paragraph has a function okay that point i will be coming back to of course uh, in every paragraph there are different types of sentences also that also we need to know uh, that particular point i will come back to i am not explaining at this point and to become academic writers or scholarly writers we need research skills research skills okay. research skills are uh, main research skill is one one is uh, ability to search for sources where should we search how should we search what are the sources that we have to search is it's a skill like uh, in in uh, the beginning as i told you that this is a formal kind of enterprise okay as we have understood that academic writing is a formal kind of enterprise a okay. formal technical and objective kind of an enterprise we need to be very very conscious of the sources that we use okay the sources that we use uh, should be of great uh, it is of great importance because uh, you know we can use only academic sources and not non academic sources okay. uh, for example uh when you are writing about uh, a literary work your most important source is your secondary sources okay secondary sources are previously published papers on the topic that you have chosen i mean the book that you have chosen for example you have taken uh, anil's cost by michael ondachi sri lanka writer you want to write a paper about that and uh, what you have to first search for is how many papers are already published on this in scholarly journals okay scholarly journals uh, also are to be classified in different uh, things uh, certain journals are considered uh, in a standard and certain journals are not considered standard the basic rule is that a journal which is following blind peer reviewing okay blind peer reviewing uh, meticulously Uh, following blind peer review blind peer review means you know that it will be the paper that you are sending will be sent to three different uh, you know three or two uh, different uh, peer reviewers and they will not know who you are okay they will get only the paper that's why it is blind okay the word blind means they do not know the author they do not understand where this paper is coming is it written by an indian or an american or a japanese man they will not know okay right this paper's author is not known even the the gender of this author is not known the cultural identity of this author is not known only the topic and the paper will be sent to them they will give a review based on the review only based on the reviews of you know normally in, in all standard journals they follow three level blind peer review so based on this only the papers are getting published 
So uh, when you uh, search for sources, what you have to keep in mind is that you have to search sources that are credible, okay, that are academic. You know, for example, newspaper articles are not considered to be credible academic sources. Okay, articles published in in uh, magazines, common magazines, you know, uh, in any language for that matter, is not considered authentic. Okay, right? Of course, if in the absence of other sources, you may also be made make use of that. For example, if your if your uh, study is on newspaper reports, you, know, you will definitely have to use newspaper reports. But otherwise, it is not considered as a source because they don't acknowledge the sources. Okay, they don't give a work cited there. Okay? That's why it is not. Okay? So every credible uh, you know research source will very clearly demarcate the sources of their information, and they will give a work cited or a bibliography. Okay? That, that will be that. And another very important uh, skill to master before becoming a, uh, uh, a learned academic uh, writer or a scholarly writer is the ability to cite sources. In, in, in papers that we write, normally there are two types of uh, citations. One is, you know, as all of you are aware, one is parenthetical citation and the other is work cited or bibliographic. This, these are the two levels of uh, citations. Parenthetical citation is that, you know, in within the text itself, you know, where parenthetical citation is called in-text citation. That is, immediately after you use a quotation or a statement from another person or a paraphrased statement from another person, another writer, you will immediately after that you will give in bracket some indication according to the style of citation that you are using. You know, in the for humanities normally we make use of MLA style of documentation. But in teaching of English and linguistics and all that, people uh, very often make use of APA style of documenting. What are we? What would be the style of documentation that you are using? Normally, we have to give the last name of the author plus page numbers in, in, within brackets in, in most of the citation styles. And at the end, you know, and elaborate. You know, the the last name that we give in bracket should have an entry which is beginning with that in the work cited. Right? And one more thing that uh, I need to tell as a prerequisite for writing is developing the habit of reading scholarly papers. That is, scholarly papers are published in scholarly journals, and therefore you have to develop habit of reading them. Today, you know, uh, the standard journals are uh, you know classified under different consortia of uh, journals. For example, uh, UGC is providing N list, you know, uh, set of journals. So thousands of journals are available under N list. And they are very credible sources. And list is a very credible source for. And we have certain other source for for humanities related uh, thing. There is a kind of journal consortia called uh, you know Project Muse. We have ProQuest. We have uh, you know EBSCO and many other uh, consortia are there. Consortia JSTOR is there. Okay. These are all consortia. Okay. If you take any kind of journal article from these consortia, you can be sure that they are from standard journal because. These consortia do not include any lower graded journal in their list. Uh, for example, I think uh, for literature, the most, uh, shall we say, useful consortia for literature students is JSTOR and uh, Project Muse. Project Muse are very, very uh, powerful sources. You can get a large number of journals and articles from these. Project Muse is not included in, in Enlist or uh, in Flipnet. Uh, we will have to, other institutions may have subscribed it, only then we will be able to use them. Only if our institution is subscribing, they will be able to use them. Individuals will not be able to subscribe because it's very expensive. Lakhs of rupees will have to be paid every year for that. So if an institution is uh, subscribing it, you can make use of them. That is a very, such kind of sources you can make make use of for reading the scholarly papers. Okay? Reading the scholarly papers is will give you uh, an idea of how scholarly papers are written, and I'm coming back to you know because because I'm not able to touch upon all the topics you know in in, in that part uh, that I have previously discussed. I'm touching upon only a few few points. Okay, that too not very complete because you know uh, this has to be each of these points have to be taught uh, in you know, so many hours at least, and therefore I'm trying to minimize my discussions. Uh, there are three types of paragraphs in an essay. Okay? Right, you know, we write essays, and essays are cons constituted by paragraphs, and uh, three types of essay paragraphs are there. introductory paragraph. There's only one introductory paragraph in an essay, and 
any number of body paragraphs and and one concluding paragraph. But this is a very essential. Thing. That is, there is a there is a uh, clear difference between an introductory paragraph and a body paragraph. And all these three different types of paragraphs are different from each other. The method of writing introductory paragraph is different from the method of writing a body paragraph. For example, uh, in, it, is, it is in the introductory paragraph that we introduce the thesis statement. Okay? Okay. Thesis statement. Or we make announcement about the directions uh, you know, uh, taken by this paper. And it is in the body paragraph that body paragraph is each body paragraph will focus on one idea which is called a premise. Okay, premise. Okay. Actually, a paper consists of premises and premises and a conclusion. Okay. The conclusion of the paper is what you call uh, its thesis statement. Okay. And in all academic writings in humanities, because we follow a kind of inverted style of writing. We present the conclusion in the beginning itself. Okay? Our conclusion of the paper, conclusion of the study will not come at the end, rather at the beginning. Okay? That is our central argument, the central claim that we make about the book that we have chosen or the subject that we have chosen, the, the issue that we have chosen will be presented in the opening paragraph. Okay? Introductory paragraph should definitely contain. Okay. Of course, once you become a very experienced and expert writer, you may, you may be able to play with the techniques and all that. But uh, at the, in, during the formative years of your learning of academic writing, it is essential that you need to follow this basic rule that introductory paragraph should introduce the thesis statement. You should give a background statement. You should give some statements about the, you know, shall we say, research gap on this topic, some indications on the research gap on this topic. And you can also uh, tell about, you can introduce the thesis statement, okay, and you can also tell, the, you can also announce what exactly are you trying to do in this paper, that's called announcement. In this paper, uh, you know, an attempt is made and all that. And such kind of statements are called uh, announcements, okay. So those announcements can be there. You know, announcements also give indication on which direction is taken by the paper. So, uh, as I told you, a paragraph is for one idea. You know, premises, there are many premises and one conclusion in an essay. And each premise required a paragraph to explain. And each, when, uh, when you write each paragraph, okay, uh, you know, we use uh, different types of sentences in a paragraph. Okay. Paragraph, I, I mean body paragraphs. Okay. Body paragraphs are the most important paragraphs in an essay because they come in large numbers okay any number suppose you have uh, 50 premises to reach your conclusion to explain your conclusion 50 points to reach to explain your to substantiate your conclusion or substantiate your thesis statement you have 50 paragraphs plus one introductory paragraph plus one concluding paragraph concluding paragraph summarizes everything uh, you know returning to the thesis statement and uh, in, in, uh, when you say different type of sentences, you know, for example, in a body paragraph, we have a state, we have a type of sentence called topic sentence. Topic sentence is a sentence that tells what this paragraph is about. It is something like something similar to the thesis statement for an essay. So this is a thesis statement for the paragraph. Topic sentence is the thesis statement for the paragraph. It, its scope is there only within that paragraph, of course. The statement that you are making is, uh, you know, in uh, in an effort to add value to your central claim. Therefore, topic sentence is very, very crucial in a, in a sentence. And when you give a topic sentence, you need to elaborate that. Okay? Elaborate that means, you know, what we what we call is, uh, you know, substantiation. Okay? You need to explain. For example, you need to. What do you mean by this? You have to say that. What is the evidence again? Okay? That is, how do you come to this kind of an observation? What? How do you come to this kind of a kind of uh, uh, reading, you have to give evidence. Evidence is maybe textual evidence and you know, secondary and tertiary kind of right? And uh, thesis statement uh, is announced in the opening paragraph, as I told you. And uh, the types of sentences in a body paragraph include topic sentence, substantiation through evidence, and transition signals. Okay. Transition signals are used to connect the paragraph. Actually, the whole essay should, is connected in a thread. Okay. 
the thread is running from beginning to the end. You know, a reader should not get disconnected. Okay, you have to go in a flow. Okay, that is your ideas are gradually being presented. Okay, the most important ideas come first, and lesser important ideas come come later. Okay, right. So uh, every paragraph, when when you are moving from one idea to the next, you have to give some kind of a transition signal. You know, for which very often we may have to use you know certain discourse markers. You know, right. Like, uh, However, this and you know all, the, all that kind of things, okay, right? So you need to show some transition. Transition can either appear in the beginning of a paragraph or at the end of a paragraph. Okay? You can you can connect with the previous paragraph in the first sentence itself, or you can at the end you can say that this idea leads us to the next idea. Okay? That is that. So these things you will be able to understand only if you read very closely. Read. Some sample papers. You know what you can do is you can take certain sample papers in order to understand the technique of writing scholarly papers. What is essentially required is you need to take three or four sample papers, study them thoroughly, divide them into different, uh, shall we say, uh, units, okay, and see how each element, this each sentence is working in this, in this uh, paper. So such kind of an effort also you can take. And I want to also mention, you know, before uh, uh, you know, concluding, uh, the writing process. Okay, the writing process can be divided into three sections. Of course, you know, as uh, in all writing processes, whether it is journalistic writing or academic writing or any other kind of writing, pre-writing, writing, and revising is the process that we have to follow. Okay? In the pre-writing stage, in a scholarly writing paper, we have to narrow down the topic. We have to identify the research gap. That is. You know, identifying the research gap is quite essential because you know uh, uh, when you write a, a paper, you know as I always say, we are joining an ongoing conversation. Okay? Suppose you are writing a paper on uh, uh, a novel, uh, Arkana Ryan's The Guide, or any other novel for that matter. Uh, what you do is you are joining a, an ongoing conversation on Arkana Ryan's The Guide. The Guide is already discussed by so many different, you know, shall we say, academicians. Okay? And you are going to be, uh, you know, the last person to join. Okay? Last means, you know, you, after you, many people will come. Okay? Now, at this particular point, you are joining this conversation. Okay? And after you uh, join this, con so many others will join in future. You need not worry about who is joining in future, but you need to worry definitely about what is already said by the previous commentators of the novel called the guide. That knowledge is what we, what gives that that experience would give us. An idea of the research book. What is already said about Arkana Ryan's novels? What is not said about Arkana Ryan? Suppose, suppose the idea that you want to work on is already elaborately discussed by people, you know, other writers, there is no point in working on that. It, it may not be very significant. Your study will not make any impact in the academy. Once you come out with a new idea, definitely you will be courted by future writers. Okay, right? You will be that is where you know we get uh, what we call uh, you know. That is where we get uh, citation index. So many, how many people are citing your paper? That is a very important yardstick for assessing a person's research quality. And of course, as I told you, gathering sources from other, uh, you know, authentic sources. And uh, at this stage, you need to prepare a working bibliography. Whenever you get a material, you have to first include them in a bibliography, okay? so that these bibliographical details are quite important for us. Now, you need to very clearly know. Where your statements have come from, including the page numbers and the book details, the, the date of publication, the publisher, things like that. And at the pre-writing stages, uh, at pre-writing stage, you have to develop a thesis statement. A thesis statement can be modified later, you know, according to your premises. But you need to have something to write with, something to start with that need to be done. Okay? And once your thesis statement is uh, created, you need to list out the major premises that you are using to substantiate your thesis statement, right? And uh, the writing stage, you know, you need to develop each of the premise into a paragraph, okay? and each of the paragraph you have to cite the sources. Okay? That is the, the, the most important part. And writing introduction and conclusion is another another important task. And usually. Some people start with the introduction, but it is better to write the introduction after writing your body paragraphs okay? because you know introduction is your introduction is an introduction of your uh, you know body paragraphs, the whole paper. So when you write the introduction after writing the entire paper, it will you know you will be able to write it properly. Yes. And of course, conclusion is 
you know, summarizing the entire thing, okay, very briefly. And the third stage is revising. Revising uh, requires, uh, shall we say, very thorough editing, uh, accuracy of the information that you have given, accuracy of the citations that you have given, accuracy of the language you use for those things like that. In the writing process, you know, uh, there are a lot of language related things, you know, you, owing to time constraints, I don't be able to discuss all those uh, things. But I'll, I'll mention a few things, you know, even though I'll not be able to mention everything. So revising is a very, very important stage. Okay, right? Revising is a kind of editing uh, stage in which you ensure that your paper is ready for a scholarly reader. Okay, right? Your reader is, uh, your readers cannot be underestimated. Your readers are very scholarly people. So you need to produce something which is suitable to them. Okay? That is the important thing. And about language use, I'll, I'll just mention a very few things. You know, this is not a complete list, you know. Uh, very few things that about language use, you know, we have already mentioned in the beginning that uh, we use less frequently used words, okay, right? Now, in academic writing, there are so many things which are not advisable to be used, okay? A few of them I will give you, it's not a complete list. Now, for example, we are not permitted to use contracted forms in academic writing. We are not uh, permitted to use um, means we are we are uh, you know asked to avoid them. Now, I'm not saying that we are completely avoid. Okay, right? Uh, for example, contracted forms, uh, informal verbs, like very very informal kind of verbs and phrasal verbs, intensifiers. Okay, a bit, a lot of, couple of, sort of, not enough, totally, really, very, and all that. It is better to avoid them. Okay. Informal transition signals like so, anyways, but yeah, these are normally used in spoken English. Any any kind of word that you frequently use in spoken English need to be avoided okay, in, in formal writing. Okay. And the first person and second person point of view need to be avoided for uh, formative years of your uh, writing career. It is better to avoid them. I, me, us, we, you, and your, and all that. Run on expressions like etc., so on, and so forth. Okay. Unsophisticated and too simple, you know, verbs and other expressions like big. Yeah, sorry, bad, good, nice, cheap, right, wrong, and all that. Uh, words indicating absolute quality, all and every, okay. superlatives, best, most. Now, this is a very, very short list. This goes on and on. Actually, I have given a full list of these things in the book that I have written on academic writing for uh, University of Calicut. So that book contains all that, uh, that uh, list. Uh, that is all from my side. Uh, I think uh, I have just given you a very broad introduction. Uh, now you can ask me questions, you know, so that I can elaborate at uh, this point. Thank you, sir. You have put a lot of effort in the, into the session. It was very stimulating and we learned a lot, sir. Thank you so much once again, sir. You can ask. Uh, Thank you all. Yeah. We will go ahead and take some. Yes, ma'am. Thank you all. We will uh, go ahead and take some of your questions now. Yes, you can. You can either type the questions here on the chat box, or uh, you can you can uh, directly ask. Both are okay for me. Any any uh, point you want me to explain further, you can ask because you know in an hour's presentation I'll not be able to uh, you know deal with everything. Okay? I, I have just uh, glanced over all those uh, points. You can. Uh, good evening, sir. This is the state of your assistant, Tony, sir, Department of English, sir. Uh, and uh, I am also the uh, research scholar, sir. I, uh, first, I will uh, I just convey my thanks to you, sir, for uh, regarding this webinar. This is very useful, uh, informative uh, we got uh, in this session. And uh, uh, I want to know, know the Quantitative method and the qualitative method refers to uh, this. Uh, which one is suitable uh, in English, uh, English sir? Okay. That, that's a very important question, ma'am. I should have uh, addressed that. 
actually you know uh, we use uh, qualitative uh, research in literature we use qualitative method okay, because we don't have data you know whenever there is data involved you know this it becomes quantitative for example uh, when you do elt sometimes you may have to use quantitative methods okay, certain quantitative methods for example you know uh, when you calculate uh, uh, the responses of students you know when you are teaching reading or writing and all that certain quantitative methods you may have to use but when you do research in literature the method is completely qualitative completely qualitative here we are not arriving at our conclusions based on the data that we have gathered rather we are arriving at uh, our conclusions you know uh, based on logical reasoning so we make reasoned arguments okay? reasoned arguments are different from mere opinions okay? so we are not making mere opinions rather reasoned arguments opinions you know may not opinions are uh, opinions and arguments probably look uh, one and the same but the difference is that in opinions there won't be reasons for holding their opinion for somebody is saying after watching a a uh, movie someone may make some very common comments about the movie or film but they may not explain why they are holding that kind of opinion whereas in literary kind of uh, literary kind of shall we say research what we do is we give a, a, a conclusion or we give a, a a claim or an argument and we give reasons for holding that argument that reason is a very elaborate reason right therefore our method is qualitative and not quantitative i hope it is clear to you thank you sir thank you very much sir and uh, how does uh, anova working sir anova search method how does anova research method is working sir i think uh, anova is one of the statistical tools I, as far as i understand right it is a statistical tools uh, i know i have understood as a statistical tool that is being used by people who use uh, you know qualit quantitative research not uh, qualitative as far as i understand i do not know whether there is whether there is any other meaning for this anova but as far as i understand it is a tool used in statistics you know to arrive at uh, the, the figures and conclusions right thank you sir thank you there's one more question in the chat box sir okay right you got to use uh, theories in research paper can you throw some light okay right uh, yes uh, mr sohail it is a very important question actually you know it's it's a very very uh, important thing today that literary theory has become uh, an unavoidable uh, shall we say component in literary research in fact because i didn't go deep into literary research i didn't mention this uh normally uh, you know prior to this onset of literary theories and you know the popularity of literary theories people were not using literary theories very widely but now in last 20 years probably literary thesis is considered complete only when the literary researcher is using a lot of theories okay that is that is the scenario what is the use of what is you know you know that literary theories are not directly connected to literature okay they are they belong to different other disciplines okay for example you know a theory may belong to marxism a theory may be belonging to uh, sociology theory may be belonging to history or historicism and certain other philosophical movements like uh, postmodernism poststructuralism and all that okay right and on these these philosophical and uh, other moments you know in an in, because we are following an interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary you know research these days we are permitted to use these theories as tertiary sources okay, right now in research we use three different types of sources i have uh, mentioned it indirectly in several places one is a primary source you know and when you do research in literature your primary source is the text that you have chosen suppose you are working on the novels of amitabh ghosh the novels by amitabh ghosh are the primary sources the text that you have chosen are the primary sources secondary sources are writings on the primary source so writings on the primary say you know suppose 50 or 100 people have written papers scholarly papers on amitabh ghosh's novels you know they can be considered as secondary sources okay, right 
And theory comes under the tertiary sources. Tertiary, as the name indicates, is the ter third type of source. Okay. These third type of sources are not directly connected to uh, you know your topic or literature. They are they are general theories or the general assumptions. You know. Uh, theoreticians of, and philosophers, they try to explain phenomena in the world. For example, Slavoj Zizek has written an interesting book on uh, systemic violence, you know, as it is existing in the society. Right? Your understanding, you know, Slavoj Zizek's understanding of systemic violence can be, you know, used as a kind of tertiary tech, you know, material, as a kind of uh, theory in explaining certain theory, certain literary works that you have chosen. Okay? Right? So in that sense, it is useful. Now, because it is a trend, it is a trend all over the world. Even when you give papers in international seminars and all that, you know they will they will they will check two things. One is they will check whether there is a very strong thesis in your uh, abstract. Second thing that they normally check is whether it is supported by some theoretical development. So theoretical developments will make your study interdisciplinary on the one hand. It will make your study more serious. Okay, right. Any theory can be used, no, uh, but the only uh, you know, rule that you have to follow here is that you cannot use multiple theories in a single study. It is better to stick to one uh, or one line of thinking. You know, maybe uh, suppose you are taking historicism as a theoretical background, you can make use of the works of uh, you know, several uh, writers who come under his new historicism. But not, you know, in one chapter you are following historicism, another chapter you are following psychoanalysis, another chapter you are following, you know, you know this uh, uh, post-structuralist training. That is not normally allowed. You have to stick to one theoretical school. That, that is uh, the only rule. Otherwise, you know, theory is welcome to be used. It's a very, very important question. Thank you for asking that. Well, thank you, sir. There are a few questions uh, in chat box, sir. Okay, right. Yes. Uh, I'll come one by one. Okay, right. Right. Uh, on methodology, okay. I think that's not a question. Research paper will be accepted in journals. Will research papers be accepted in the journals only if theories are there, meaning without analysis like tabular columns, graphs, etc. Uh, here I want to say that you know this tabular columns, graphs, and other things are applicable only in certain subjects like uh, you know uh, ELT, uh, you know stylistics, and you know uh, such kind of things. Okay, linguistics and all that in in English studies. In literary studies, normally we don't need to give any kind of charts and all that. We have to express our uh, arguments. We have to substantiate our claims only through different paragraphs. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so paragraphs are the sources for us to explain things. Okay? It's not we, we don't need uh, any kind of you can you can take for example you know what I suggest to you is that uh, before you think of publishing a paper the first uh, thing that you need to do is you need to know uh, you need to be aware of the your target journal okay? target journal where exactly are you going to publish because every target journal have different expectations. Suppose you want to publish your journal in, in the uh, you know in, in the journal called Arial. Arial is an international journal of literature. You need to go to Arial website and uh, read their you know uh, basic instructions for all shall we say contributors. There are some guidelines. Okay, submission guidelines will be there. You have to follow the guidelines as such. Every journal has got a different set of guidelines. And you can also try to get a sample paper published in that journal. Okay, you can follow the same method. Because uh, every journal will have a citation style, a uh, you know, method of giving referencing. So it all depends on, you know, you cannot write one common paper and send it to any journal. Okay? You are sending, when you send uh, an article for publication, you are sending it according to the needs and expectations of specific journals. Okay? That is the most important. So uh, I think I have uh, answered this question. And in terms of theories, you know, because you have also asked theories, uh, if your argument is very, very strong, even if there is no theory, it may be accepted. Okay? But it is always better to have some theoretical inputs because theory adds a third type of material in your research, a tertiary source. It's a value addition. Okay? You know, the value of a research paper is primarily, uh, you know, assessed by the number of sources that you are citing. The more number of sources you are citing, 
the more research you have done okay that is the indication if you have you know, only one or two entries in the work cited it means that you have not done any kind of research okay your research is serious only when you have a large number of work cited that uh, matter you need to keep in mind i hope it's clear yes sir uh, i think uh, uh, professor mamadri has raised a hand you know he can ask a question please sir Which journal is best to publish the paper? Okay, right. Now you have one question. Before the others ask the question, I'll just explain this. You know, uh, the journal that you select depends on your uh, area of research. Okay, because most journals are uh, subject specific. For example, uh, the journal may be a journal of postcolonial literature. The journal may be a journal of poetry. Journal uh, or uh, journal of uh, shall we say fiction. For example, there is a journal called Modern Fiction Studies. Okay. Modern fiction studies, you cannot send a paper on a drama in modern fiction studies. Like, uh, you know, uh, drama quarterly and, you know, all those kind of, uh, you know, critical quarterly is a journal for literary theory, for uh, example. Okay. Uh, you know, American literary history is a, is a journal which, uh, you know, invites studies related to history. So, a journal, each journal has got its own priorities. Okay. You have to, depending on the paper that you want to write, you have to search the journals and identify the journal which is best suitable for your your paper. Any others? Yes. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, it looks like uh, we have covered all our questions. Okay. Uh, is there anything else you want to uh, cover, sir? If if, uh, if if anybody else want to ask a question, you can, they can ask. You know, not an issue for me. Uh, oh. <laughs> yes, uh, sir. Uh, uh, lately, uh, most of these uh, PhD scholars they are facing a uh, lot of hurdles in when when they go for submitting the papers uh, they they face a lot of uh, issues uh, relating to the plagiarism okay. is there uh, any techniques to avoid plagiarism and what are all the uh, ways um, to keep ourselves our uh, works uh, genuine uh, if if there are any uh, techniques uh, please share it sir. thank yeah. you thank you professor nazi for asking this is a very very fundamental question in uh, research today uh, actually, you know, when you uh, submit a paper or a dissertation, you know, uh, your paper is checked for plagiarism, okay, using uh, softwares like Turnitin and, you know, Outpunt and all that. What they do is that uh, the main function of uh, plagiarism detection software is to see whether there is any kind of, uh, uh, shall we say, uh, ideas being recurring in, in your uh, used in your paper is recurring in in any other sources okay, right it is it is it is it is called a similarity uh, kind of index okay similarity index. So is your paper similar to anything which is already existing there okay? which is published before you have written okay your paper right similarity that is what they detect okay? and similarity comes when you know when you use, you know, there are there are certain technical issues also here. Suppose you know, put, put certain things in quotation marks also. Sometimes it may be shown as plagiarism. So. But uh, advanced softwares like uh, Outpunt has got uh, you know ways to avoid them, okay? ways to avoid them being treated as plagiarism. So. And in in uh, Turnitin, for example, they will show very clearly each paragraph. They will show where it is taken from. They will show okay? each everything. You know, if your sentence is your own, they will say it is unique. Everything which is coming from any other source will be very, very clearly shown. So what we need to uh, primarily understand is that we have to very clearly distinguish our words from the words of others. Okay? That we have to be very, very careful. Right? Now, when we use sentence structures, it is believed that you know, if you use a sentence which more than two words should not be you know, uh, already used by anybody else. Right? There may be some amount of similarities allowed in research papers because it is not possible for you to avoid completely avoid you know repeating the sentences and you know word uh, collocations that are already used by me. Up to two words, it is it won't be shown as a plagiarism. So uh, you know to an extent it is permissible. The only thing that we have to keep in mind is 
whenever we take the uh, you know ideas and quotations both are dangerous again you can either take a direct quotation or you can take a paraphrased form of a quotation again both are considered to be plagiarism okay unless you give it in quotation marks and cite the source right so this thing we have to keep in mind and uh, internet uh, see, is is uh, the main source of information for all this okay right sometimes you know uh, you know there may be a question suppose if you copy from a source which is not there on the internet will they catch you you know sometimes they may ask this uh, turn it in software may not be able to find you out but the readers will be able to find out okay in in the recent cases many cases in for example in some universities after 30 or 40 years of submission people have come out explaining that you know the plagiarism in uh, software is okay right so you, you you need to pass the you know shall we say plagiarism test as well as you know this uh, ethical test okay that is we have to clear on our side sometimes you know the plagiarism may happen unknowingly also okay anyway we have to prevent this stuff so simple rule is differentiate between your words and other words with quotations and cite the source very minutely that is the only thing that we need to do otherwise we need not worry about the pages thank you sir very very nice question professor uh, nasi any anything else i i hope there's no more questions in the chat box okay. thank yeah. you thank you so much for your work as well okay thank you for brightening the session We'll move on to the next. Oh, I would like to. Thank you, sir. So thank you for your wonderful. Thank you very much, ma'am, for giving me the opportunity to speak to all of you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Akshay. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so, ma'am, it's time. Uh, yes. Now, I would like to invite our faculty members and PhD scholars to deliver your paper presentation. Our faculty members are invited to present their paper. Uh, there are certain members who informed me that they are ready to present the papers under yes. the. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. Ma uh. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. Mm. Good afternoon, one and all present here. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. for giving me an opportunity to present my paper and uh, just i wish to share it. this one this one Nandal present here. Uh, my paper published in a book called "Higher Education After COVID-19: An Indian Perspective." Okay, my topic is the impact of COVID-19 on higher education changes and challenges. And uh, my aim of this article is uh, um, during the pandemic situation, the world drastically just. Uh, terrible! It's uh, affected so badly. No, so in this situation, how higher education affected, and what are the changes and challenges due uh, due to COVID nineteen? Okay, that is my aim. And then, so this article focuses on new trends in teaching learning, the effect of a shrinking global economy, 
great global collaboration between students, academia, and industry. And uh, finally, I argued about challenges to the students. Uh, then, uh, new trends in teaching learning. Because of uh, COVID-19, uh, full lockdown, we know that. And then, because of sudden lockdown, we drastically changed our teaching methodology, first of all. And the teach, being a teacher, am I audible? Am I okay to you? My voice is okay, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma okay, thank you. So, uh, uh, new trends in teaching learning. First change to my observation is teaching. Okay, even though we are, technically we are not that much, to my opinion, uh, we are not uh, that much uh, what familiar with we change, we shift from offline to online. Online has become the default mode of education during this time. Then immediate effect response of the crisis was to go digital. And higher, especially higher education institutions have started conducting orientation program, induction meetings and counseling classes, everything through online. And through, uh, through the different modes, Gmeet, Yammers, this, like that okay and uh, this paper i published uh, uh, seven months before because of uh, i think it's new now um, this uh, this is applicable now also the effect of shrinking global economy this is main important thing as we are all over the world suffering you know uh, due to covid 19 economy has badly affected throughout the world especially in the education field they couldn't even in what way you know what extent you know they couldn't pay their fees also. And the government guided the institution, education institution. Even now we heard, uh, day before also, we heard from Tamil Nadu government, we, should, we shouldn't uh, insist the students to pay full payment. Okay, 75 percentage only we should collect. So that much we suffered. And uh, uh, consequences of this, unemployed, uh, unemployment problem arise. And then... Uh, my next focus is emerging approaches of India for higher education during this time. Okay, problems are there. These are the uh, challenges for us. How can we uh, face that one? Okay, various strategies introduced. And ICT, uh, UGC are, uh, provide many ideas and technologies to follow, um, to develop and follow in higher education. For example, Gyan Kosh, Swayam, Adyan, National Digital Library of India, Virtual Labs. It's, it's just I mentioned very few here. I mentioned very few. And then uh, it extends a lot. Then challenges. What are challenges? Distance learning will reinforce teaching and learning approaches that we do not that we know do not network at all. So we usually we usually say there is a network issue because of that we are communicating system is very less. And then uh, we know that students how much problem they are facing. Okay, daily we are listening the problems how we are facing and uh, automatically the attendance percentage of students is reduced. But we should fight for that uh, we are grabbing them to come to the class like anything. They, this is one of the major problem because they go to the uh, just they search their jobs to fulfill the their financial problems in their family. Okay, especially in India, this happened, and which affected global economy also. And educators will be overwhelmed and unsupported to do their jobs well. Okay, there is no time limit at all for the. Educationist, I think so. We we also the frontline workers, to my opinion, because psych, we are training them psychologically fit to the world. As as the doctors, uh, frontline workers, and uh, other uh, police uh, police department, everybody working to protect people from the COVID nineteen this pandemic situation. They work lot and lot. What is our duty? What is our challenge? You know. The very important challenge is in front of us that we are educating the, we are not, uh, not education is uh, apart from education, we are educating them apart from that psychologically we are trained them to face the situation and how to develop the education 
education and uh, their life, etc. School closes will widen the equity gaps. So, um, and how we face this? Next, my next target is opportunities. Okay, changes, challenges are there. What are the opportunities to develop ourselves? Especially in education, higher education. Blended learning approaches will be tried, tested, and increasingly <coughs> used. And teachers and schools will receive more respect, appreciation, and support for their important role in society. Quality teaching and learning materials will be better, better and more widely used. Next, uh, uh, teaching collaboration also grown during this time. And then, next, uh, finally, I wish to close this uh, paper like this. How higher education can adapt to the future work? The future, how can we? Actually, this is the generation of Z. A generation that has grown up in a truly globalized world. For them, what, how can we educate? Commit to strengthen education as a common good. We, 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 uh, we shouldn't uh, what um, make them afraid about education. They, it's it's a, like a, a, like eating, like uh, watching music. We should create, we should cultivate the habit that education is a very good thing to learn for their life. Expand the definition of the right to education. This is very important to me. Value the teaching profession and teacher collaboration ensure scientific literacy within the curriculum. So these are the gist of my paper. Uh, I just uh, uh, so shortly reviewed my paper. And I wish to share one more uh, paper, sir, if, if you can. Uh, if Ma'am, shall I? Yes, we can, ma'am. Yes. yes. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much for uh, listening to the first paper. And uh, now I'm sharing the okay. another paper uh, because uh, this paper published this month. This is Shakespeare and Existentialism. I like this. Uh, we know we, uh, we like Shakespeare more. And then uh, Usually, yeah, unavoidable plays who has uh, who is the greatest dramas, dramatist in this world. Okay, existentialism is a very attractive topic that is, uh, we, the people, live in this world. What is the difference between us and the others? What is Shakespeare's opinion? How he expressed in his uh, plays? So, these are the things I wish to explore. So this paper explored that only too shortly, I, I can tell. Um, so uh, we know uh, what is exceptionalism and uh, what he thought, what ex, uh, Shakespeare and exceptionalist thoughts are focused mainly in human beings life in a meaningful and lovable manner. Okay, so he can express uh, Shakespeare's uh, talent or his speciality is through the characters he can express love, passion, friendship, fear, ambition, everything, um, which which can reflect, which is a mirror of society, not only his period. That is the speciality of his work. That is why I took this. Okay, I, I took this topic. And then I just uh, scroll like this, which to uh, highlight very few places. Shakespeare's plays Hamlet and King Leo. Uh, it's uh, my favorite uh, dramas. It's reflected. Sorry for uh, too shortly. I'm explaining you, people. And thanks for listening me. And then uh, in, uh, the existentialist novelist is a philosophical Hamlet. Hamlet of our age, suffering from spells of. Uh, uh, Nihilistic madness, metaphysical nausea, and on ontological dolo. So, who says so? Hamlet displays existentialism attitude throughout the play. We can see this. So, when a soliloquy, when you heard of a Hamlet soliloquy, how weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. 
So I, I just uh, take off uh, existentialism as an attitude, uh, creation of self, and then uh, under these topics, as uh, Sarah said, uh, uh, aim, my aim is to existentialism, Shakespeare and existentialism, and subtopics I took, uh, took like this, uh, alienation and disappointment, and uh, and the meaning of existence, uh, uh, here I can say, Hamlet suggests that uh, reflection is the adversary of suicide. To be or not to be, the very famous quotation, we know that. Okay, so these are all shows existentialism in Shakespeare's plays um, that they can enjoy throughout the life. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Ganeshri, ma'am, for your great presentation. Now I invite a next next presenter presenter to deliver a presentation. Harshini, ma'am, she is not here. What are the agenda? The... Any other PhD scholars to deliver a paper presentation? Okay, ma. Members, uh, shall we go for order? Member Tiffany Professor has given how to do the publication. Yes, ma'am. What is the publication target of our department? So far, we have done only six or seven papers uh, during this pandemic. Anybody else who has uh, published papers during this period? I have got some five papers. And Bhuneshwari ma'am to Harshini ma'am to Akshaya, how many did you have? Please, faculty, uh, please. Ma is not there, I'm there, ma'am. Mm. Uh, ma'am, in this pandemic, I didn't uh, publish any paper. Before the pandemic, only have published five papers. Ma okay. Yes. Okay, ma'am. We'll wind up, ma'am. The sir has left her. Huh? Yes, ma'am, sir, has left me. Okay. Okay. Uh, now, I would like to call uh, Dr. Ravati, ma'am, to deliver your vote of thanks. Thank you, sir, yes. ma'am. Mm. It is a privilege and great, great joy for me to propose my heartfelt thanks to each and everyone present here. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. V.P. Anwar Sadiq, Assistant Professor from New College, Chennai, for enlightening us with this enriching session. I thank all the participants for your energetic participation in today's event, Scholarly Writing in English Studies. I'd like to thank Mr. A.C. Shanmugam, our Founder and Chancellor, Engineer ACS, Arun Kumar Sir, our Honorable and Beloved President, for their support and guidance. I would like to extend my gratitude Dr. to Dr. C.B. Payanivelu, Registrar, Dr. Malini Pandey, Joint Registrar, Hetching this, for extending their valuable support. I also extend my thanks to Dr. L. Ramesh, Dean of Events, for his tenacious support in all our events. I would like to thank Dr. D. B. Jebra, Joint Registrar, ENDIS, for his support and guidance. I would like to propose my thanks to Dr. Mary Thomas, Dean, Department of English, Dr. M. Chandrasena Rajeshwaran, Head, Department of English. I mean, and I would like to extend my thanks to our dear faculty members, the pillars of our department, with whom all the events become the possible dream all day. I thank all the scholars and participants who shared their knowledge via their paper presentation. Once again, I thank you all for being the part of this event. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Maharaji. Uh, but uh, I would like to have one request now. Akshaya, uh, you can... Yes, uh, stop recording. I would 